How's it going, everybody? Nice. I love the music. I feel like I need to give them some sound clips, like, wicked a wicked a whack? <laughs> Drop the bass. <laughs> I'm going to put a request. I love dubstep. There we go. <laughs> Observing that the maximum number of people who can productively, simultaneously work on CSS is one. <laughs> I, it's, uh, the thing is, is that, for the most part, I think people think that CSS is easy. That there's not really a whole lot to it. You have uh, you know, a website of HTML, uh, you throw in some stuff and you get a, a website, right? It just magically comes together. Uh, because you know we have selectors, and we have you know these properties, sort of key value pairs, pretty straightforward. Um, but then we end up with stuff that looks like this, and this scares me. This scares me for a few reasons. One is like the bang important on all this. Like this is really just an abstraction of inline style. Somebody felt really uncomfortable going style equals display block. So instead, they created a class called block, and they add that class to it. And that's not really an approach that I, I like. In fact, it kind of makes me feel like this. Here's another example. Uh, this is actually from an article on Smashing Mag, uh, written by somebody I used to work with at Yahoo. Uh, and uh, this is the approach they were using for their project at Yahoo. Uh, and again, this, this feels like uh, an abstraction of inline styles. And from a naming convention perspective, that I, how do I understand that if I'm looking at my code base, that I know what FZ hyphen S means? Um, is that going to be clear when I come into a project um, to know what to do? Um, another example. Um, this was from the Drupal website. Uh, and they had a bunch of code, and I've kind of snipped some stuff. But you can kind of get the sense here where they repeated the same code for different sections of the website. And on one hand, this is kind of good. Like, I can change my main navigation from all the other navigation and know that nothing is going to break. That's fantastic. Um, but if we wrote CSS for each piece on our website, despite the repeating patterns, our CSS would just balloon. Um, so, you know, from the maintenance perspective, trying to figure out what works and what doesn't. Uh, this one's from MySpace. And you know, there's, there's a lot of stuff being written here, when really, what do I care about? Um, I care about what the status bar looks like, right? The stuff at the far right is what I'm really trying to style. But instead, there's all this other stuff that is attached to it um, to get the look and feel that we want. I am not without blame. Uh, this is from my own website, uh, which I coded five years ago. Uh, but the interesting thing is, is that I have not updated my website in five years. Uh, from a design perspective, I have written once or twice. Um, but again, you know, looking at my site, what did I care about the most? I cared about styling the author name and the comment number. Right? These are, I, I wrote a lot more CSS than I needed to. Uh, when I first started at Shopify, uh, this was our CSS. It's one file. We use SAS, right? SAS saves, solves all our problems. Um, coming into a project like that where, you know what, I'm going to change something in one place um, and realizing that it's breaking something somewhere else, so I have to make that change, but it broke something somewhere else. Um, and I continue to like fiddle and refactor and play with things uh, to try to get some semblance of something that is actually going to work. And instead, uh, yeah, it doesn't go well. This is what 
the Shopify CSS looks like today. Um, it is uh, a bunch of modules. Um, we have managed to uh, break things down in a way that actually makes sense uh, and make it easier for uh, a growing company to work on this project. See, when I was at Yahoo, uh, I worked uh, on a team of prototypers. There was five of us. We worked with a team of 30 designers and we worked with 200 engineers. We had four or five different projects that we were working on, things like mail, messenger, calendar, uh, and a few others. And the approach we took was to build this central library of resources that all the teams could use. Because, you know, to use Dan's metaphor of throwing things over the fence, the designers, their process was for the designers to take a PSD and give it to the engineering team, and then in three to six months, they would get a product back. Now, if you could imagine taking that PSD and giving it to multiple teams, how are those teams going to solve that problem? Chances are they're each gonna do it differently. They're not gonna come up with the same solution. And we noticed this very early on. One of the first widgets we did was an autocomplete widget. Simple text field, I type something in, I get a little drop down. So from a prototyping team, we built out this prototype. Showed all the JavaScript, worked great. A Couple weeks later, the mail team came back and said, excellent, we took your prototype and we've rebuilt it. Looks fantastic. Okay, that's cool. Uh, a couple weeks later, the messenger team comes back. Hey, we took your autocomplete widget, we rebuilt it. And I'm like, uh, guys, we just did the same thing three times. You know, there's opportunities for us to share um, the work that we're doing. So at Shopify, how did we get to this point where we took that one massive file where everything just got thrown onto the bottom to this nice, lean, clean CSS? We could just blow it all to hell. I was really lucky at Yahoo. When I came on board, um, they had two different mail products. Uh, they had what they called the classic version, which was a sort of traditional uh, web loading. You know, you click on something, it does a full page refresh. Um, classic web. And then they went through this redesign process where they're like, you know what, we're gonna make a JavaScript app, it's gonna feel like Outlook, there's like a bunch of panes, everything completely JavaScript driven. But unfortunately, it turned out it was actually quite slow. And you know, when you're dealing with emerging markets or slow bandwidth, that was problematic. In fact, of their 300 million users, which I was surprised they had that many, um, only half of them had moved over to the new version. So they were maintaining two different code bases and their answer to this was, let's do it a third time. So we were creating a third Yahoo Mail. Now we knew going into this, the whole purpose of this was to solve the performance issues and make sure that from a uh, UX perspective that we did this well, but we started from scratch. And it is very freeing to be able to just wipe the slate clean and start from scratch. Uh, Shopify, though, we didn't have this uh, as a possibility. So one of the things that uh, we did was look at naming convention. Um, so to provide a little bit of context, the work that I did at Yahoo um, really made me start to think about my process in building websites. And uh, I decided to sort of codify this um, in, a, in a book I had wrote. And when I was writing this, I realized that categorization was really important. Uh, so important that I basically based everything in the book about this. What's been fascinating uh, for me over the last uh, you know, three years of, of the, the, the evolution of this, uh, of my process, was recognizing, well, yeah, categorization was important, but actually naming convention was probably one of the most important things. Because there's like this joke in computer science, there's two difficult things. One is cache and validation, and the other is naming things. Uh, and it's true, right? And coming up with something that we all understand and recognize that when we come into a project that we know what something means. And CSS traditionally has not had that. You go into uh, PHP. There are PHP style guides on php.net. There are Java guidelines. You know, if you've probably heard things like abstract factory, you're like, oh, that sounds like Java. Um, and CSS has never had that because we think, well, I have an HTML element, 
I need that HTML element to be styled a certain way. Um, and the thing is, is that naming convention is just as important in CSS as it is as important in JavaScript as it is important in any kind of server-side language. Because naming convention clarifies intent. You're saying what this thing does. You're saying that a number of things might be related together. Uh, so I'm gonna jump into one thing, maybe a little contentious uh, for some of you, and this is the idea of using a class over ID. Uh, pretty much through and through. Um, there's, I think, rarely a case where you actually need to use an ID from a CSS perspective, from a CSS perspective. So if we look at the specificity chart, we've basically got four categories. Uh, so on the right, we've got element selectors, which we use for like, just, you know, what do, what do my elements look like by default? Uh, so these are gonna be your CSS resets, uh, or whatever you want an element to look like by itself. At the other end, we have inline styles, which we know are icky and we don't wanna use. So we're left with two things in the middle, class and ID. And the thing is, is the moment I throw an ID selector on it, if I ever need to override that, I've made my life that much harder. So we can keep things simple and just stick with classes. And I'm just gonna go through a really quick example of that. So we have a link. Anybody wanna guess what color that is? Just shout it out. It's blue with a little bit of green. <laughs> blue, green. Uh, this used to be my favorite color for a long time. I used to have like, all my links were always this color. Uh, but the thing is, is that not all links on my website should necessarily be blue. I went with this nice gray color, subdued. Maybe my sidebar links, I don't want them to jump out, right? I wanted to just kind of blend in with the content a little bit more. Um, but uh, you know what, I have this form that I need people to step through. Uh, and there's a cancel link on this form. I only have one on the page. I don't have a bunch all over the place. I know I'm only ever gonna have one on the page. So because I only have one, I'm gonna give it an ID. And I'm gonna style it uh, with this lovely, what color is it? Red, thank you. Uh, okay, so I've got my links, awesome. I've got my subdued links, and then I have a cancel link, perfect. Um, except you know how clients are, uh, they always have special requests. And they said, you know what, I've got this one form that I really want to encourage people to go through, and that red link kind of jumps out of them, and I don't want, them to, I don't want to scare them, right? I, I want them to just, can you use a subdued link uh, color for this? Uh, so that, uh, so that they're, they're really encouraged to move on to the next step. Okay, sure, yeah, I'll grab my cancel link and I'll throw a subdued class on it. Awesome. Uh, except because I've used an ID selector in this particular case, um, there's actually like three different rules that are trying to compete here on this particular link. I've got my regular link color, I've got my subdued class, and I've got my cancel uh, ID. Each of these things are competing on this particular element. Now, I don't know about you, but maybe on a Friday, I'm gonna take the easy way out. I'm just gonna throw a bang important on everything. Uh, done, problem solved, I'm going home for the weekend. Fantastic. Uh, but this isn't really the most maintainable approach because if I ever need to override this in other ways, I'm gonna, again, be throwing bang important on it again. Uh, not the best approach. Uh, so as great as bang important is for sort of solving things really quickly, um, for long-term maintenance, uh, it's a hassle. So uh, I would say avoid using bang important unless you absolutely, absolutely need to, which in my experience is next to never. Uh, oh, this works. Um, I can just double up on selectors. I can just solve the problem with selectors. Done, problem solved. The thing is, is that I'm creating more CSS to solve this problem, and again, this isn't something that I like to do. And this is a really easy thing to solve. From a CSS perspective, all I care is, is that I've got different categories uh, of things that I wanna style. So in this case, I have a subdued style and I have a cancel style. Why, are, why, are my, why am I trying to compete on this particular element? Why don't I separate those things out uh, so I only apply one for this particular case, which is what I've done here. So I've now got this subdued class. In my HTML, I can still have IDs, absolutely. That's not a problem whatsoever. My JavaScript can still rely on that ID, no problem whatsoever. But from a CSS perspective, nice and easy, all I have to do is apply the class that applies in this particular situation. Um, 
Other naming conventions. Come up with a module name, like a button. But you might have large buttons, small buttons, uh, default buttons, uh, search buttons. Uh, and you'll notice that the naming convention that I've used here is, is that every single button starts with the same name, right? Button hyphen whatever. And this is what I mean by naming convention clarifies intent, because I've associated these things as all belonging to the same thing. And that's important. Another example we've got, let's say modal dialogues. So with a modal dialogue, um, I might have large modal dialogues, uh, but I might actually have components that aren't part of that modal dialogue, uh, that element that I'm trying to style, um, but still are related. So I might have within that modal element, I'm gonna have a header. I'm gonna have a body, and I'm gonna have a footer. And again, I'm using the naming convention to clarify my intent, that these things are all associated together. Now, my modals are not buttons, my buttons are not modals, so the naming does not combine these in any way whatsoever. Now, probably one of the most common questions I get about this naming convention is, why not just dot .button dot .large? That works, right? Uh, CSS can do this. Um, but there's some stuff about this that I find doesn't work well in certain situations. So, for example, you may have multiple large things on your website. You might have large buttons, you might have large uh, input fields, large modal dialogues. And again, from a CSS perspective, if I'm just looking at my CSS file and I see dot .button dot .large, it's pretty clear what I want. But, uh, you know, if I had to search and replace and find every single large button on my website, because you know what? We realize from a design perspective, maybe we've built a collage, we've created our design inventory and realized, you know what, bar large buttons are not something that we need. Can we go through our entire website and find every large button? Well, okay, the kind of regex that you would need to make sure that like as a designer or a developer on this project, that somebody was consistent in doing button space large, or did they do large space button? Or did they have large default buttons? trying to find everything on a project um, becomes really difficult. Uh, Pamela Fox did a, a wonderful presentation uh, last year um, at CSSConf talking about moving from one version of Bootstrap to another. And the naming convention had m changed from one version to the next. They had actually learned these kind of mistakes and problems that they ran into, which was, okay, we now need to update all our class names. And so that alert class that they used found like every JavaScript alert that you know, was in their project, or every label, or success message, or info message that might be littered throughout their project, because CSS isn't used just in a CSS file, right? It's used in your HTML with the classes that you put in there. It's also used in your JavaScript to be applied to your project. It's used all over the place, and when you're trying to find things, name a convention can help isolate and identify things. So if you're doing a search for large, you're gonna find a whole lot of things that are not just large buttons. How many of you use um, a preprocessor? I'm gonna say the vast majority. I love how that's changed over the last couple of years. I used to ask that question, and I'd get like maybe a quarter of the hands. Um, so you're familiar with nesting, right? This is a pretty straightforward concept where I can uh, embed CSS of uh, a selector inside of another selector, and uh, well, here's the thing that kind of bugs me about this, is that if you're using GitHub and you're looking at the little preview, right, it's only gonna show you a little snippet of code. And now I'm looking at a large class and I have no idea what it belongs to. So you can see where the naming convention here, if I have that prefix on there, button hyphen large, I know exactly what it is if I'm looking here. So I like that hyphen there. It clarifies my intent. It says they're related in all these different contexts because it's not just a CSS file that I'm working with. I'm working with HTML. I'm working with GitHub. I'm working in a number of different places. And my CSS file ends up being really simple. I don't even need to nest anymore. I can just do button and button large. So my CSS is simple. My selectors are simple. I have a single class selector that I can apply to an element. I don't have to double up on things. Uh, this works out very well. So this is kind of an example of that applied to a project where I have uh, a modal, I've got buttons, 
And so I have my large modals. I've got my modal header that's part of my modal. I can see from here what is related to what. I know what belongs to what. This is very clear to me that if I need to edit a button style, I can go to my button file. I can go to the button part of my CSS and find those types of things uh, to work on. Uh, another naming convention thing, uh, states. Uh, so for example, you have a button you click on, and then we need to change it into an active state. JavaScript might need to be involved here to apply that uh, class to uh, that element. Um, in the book, I use this naming convention, which is, is button active or is button disabled? I've kind of changed my thought process on this, because it's like, am I, why am I asking a question on this particular thing? So my naming convention has changed uh, over the years, uh, and now it's very definitive. Button is active. It's not a question anymore. And I like how button lines up. Maybe I'm a little OCD, but I kind of like that. So the important thing is, is understanding you know, the purpose of these classes and what they're doing to the HTML elements in my document. Uh, and the naming convention you know, helps clarify some of these things. So for example, I've got a module name. I'm not using any hyphens. And I recognize that this, this is being applied to a root node. This is an HTML element. And nothing above it is going to be related to this. There might be some stuff below it, um, some child elements. Uh, but I know that if I see that module name in my HTML, that is my root node. Then I have submodules, uh, which are separated by um, a hyphen between the module name and the submodule name. But again, my submodule name doesn't have any hyphens. Um, and I can see in the HTML that it's a submodule because it's that class is added to my module name. And then I have subcomponents like the modal header and the modal footer, which are these child elements. And I can tell that because it's on a, an element by itself, I know that I can look up the DOM and I will find an element that is going to be my root node because it doesn't have any hyphens, doesn't have anything attached to it, um, and that's how I identify things. Um, some of you might have heard of block element modifier, BEM. Uh, they also have this same concept where you've got this root node, but they allow for hyphens in that. The way they differentiate between these different components is that a submodule um, is separated with double hyphens, and then subcomponents have double underscores. Uh, I find this really noisy, um, hard to kind of pick out what I want um, and care about. So another naming convention that I've been seeing, um, I think um, I saw Adi Osmani uh, talk about this in uh, something online, and this is the approach that they use. This is probably my favorite of all the naming conventions, even above the, the naming convention that I had started out using, uh, because I, I like the, the differentiation between subcomponents and submodules uh, here with the single and double hyphen. I like this clarity. But the important thing is, is to pick a system that works for you and your team. You know, if you're going to start refactoring all of your CSS, you're going to want to have a system that everybody on the team understands um, and knows what to do with. See, what's interesting is that when you have a, I think, very development-heavy uh, company, you know, you're doing all this back-end code or even doing JavaScript code, chances are you're doing code reviews, right? How many people here do code reviews? Oh, surprisingly little. Wow. But when it comes to CSS, even at Yahoo, it was like, oh, it's just CSS, whatever, just go ahead and commit that. Never mind the fact that, hey, uh, one team uploaded, uh, updated the, the modal dialog CSS and completely broke modal dialogs on another product. That is not something that you want. And to me, everybody on the team should be on board with whatever name and convention that you're using. Um, and it's really just important to understand that you know, this HTML element that you have needs to be styled in a certain way. Uh, and that there are certain considerations, that it's a root node, or it's a variation on that module, or you have these subcomponents on that module. So just understand what that is, come up with a naming convention and use it. So this is another thing that I think is really important. Having your CSS and HTML do one thing and one thing only. Harry Roberts. Um, gentleman out of uh, the UK, did this blog post on the single responsibility theory, taking this concept and applying it to CSS. And 
in this that you know, when you have a class applied to an element, that it's serving one purpose. Because where we get into trouble is where we have a bunch of different CSS, as you know, in that little, maybe slightly contrived example that I showed you earlier, where we had a bunch of different selectors uh, and rules being applied to the same element, and ultimately, I only cared about one of them. So here's an example of something you might see on a project, where we have a grid. And this might be a grid of components. Um, let's say it's a, a music site, and you have like album art with you know, a description of each album uh, in, laid out in this grid system. And to save yourself some effort, you're going to apply that module class and the grid column class onto the same thing. And you know, if we start looking at the CSS for this, um, I'm going to you know, maybe use some int child. Um, Sorry, I'm still kind of chuckling at a joke I made on Twitter yesterday. Sweet nth child of mine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sorry. That's... Good old Guns N' Roses. Um, so we have our grid component, right? This, this module, uh, we have these columns. So I'm, we're using floating. And let's say after every you know, sort of second or third element, um, we're just going to clear all that so it kind of clears itself and does this interesting little grid system. Um, and then I have my module that's doing something else um, that, you know, based on what it needs to do, maybe I'm using display inline block. But I've applied these things to the same element. And therefore, I'm going to have these competing styles. You know, the styles for um, my display may be conflicting with my grid styles. And the way I might end up solving this, if I had this kind of situation, is where I might do like, dot grid hyphen call dot module, and I start combining all these things, right? I throw selectors at the problem because I now need to undo the work that I've done. And this is a really simple problem to solve. I'm just going to separate that module and put it on its own element. Again, I know this is probably something that makes some people feel uncomfortable. This is like divitis, where you know it's just divs everywhere. Um, but from a, a programming perspective, this feels comfortable to me because I've separated my concerns. From a templating perspective, that I could actually separate out that module into its own element, and I can test it by itself. I can test, take my grid system and test it by itself. When I have everything combined, the only way I can test that is to test it together, which admittedly is how probably most of us in, in this room test CSS. We do the entire website, we load it up, and we see if it works. Brilliant. I've changed the CSS, I refresh the page, and it works. Fantastic. Of course, if I have a website or a web application of 100 pages, 200 modal dialogues, and you make a CSS change, how many of us are actually going to go through and update and refresh every single one of those pages? That is insane, right? Uh, so I like things to be isolatable. I like to be able to only work on the one little chunk, test it, and make sure it works, which is you know, a great extension on the stuff that Dan was talking about. If you have this thing that you're building out by itself, then you can just take that piece. You can take that atom, that molecule, that organism, and just pull it all together um, into a system. But the fact that each one lives on its own um, is pretty fantastic. Now, this is another example here, which is a little bit more subtle. Right? I've only got a single class name here, module, no other classes. But this time, this grid system is using the list item, the li, for layout purposes. If we go back to the CSS for this, this becomes a little bit more apparent. Again, very similar to what I had before. That list item is still being used for layout in the sort of layout container. And here's the thing, is that I can't take that list item, that single module, and separate it out. List items aren't designed to be by themselves. They're designed to be inside of a UL. And so that one element is no longer testable. And again, this is a really easy problem to solve. I'm going to take that and put it in its own div. This is like, this is my root node. I can isolate it. Uh, th this will live on its own. And like I said, from a templating perspective, this is really easy to template. I can now use this grid system over and over again from a programming perspective. All I have to do is say, spit whatever item I have in this grid, and I'm done. 
I don't have to do like a bunch of if else statements, like if it's this kind of grid or this kind of content, use this kind of class. If it's this kind of uh, content, use this kind of class. I can just take whatever it is and spit it in. I like this ability to templatize things. And so again, going back to that point of, you know, if I have that LI by itself that I want to test and see what it looks like, uh, chances are I've got a bunch of other styles that I need to include because list items by themselves uh, are designed to be you know, part of this UL uh, that doesn't exist here. Whereas that div, uh, it can exist on its own, and I like that. So obviously I've been touching on this a little bit, you know, that the idea of this modularization is about isolation. I want to separate these components out uh, so that they can exist on their own. Another example here uh, where I've got, let's say, uh, this horizontal nav, right? If you're looking at this CSS, you can imagine what this HTML looks like. You can imagine what I'm trying to do. I've got this UL, I've got these list items, uh, and I've got these links within my list items. Horizontal nav, nice and straightforward. And there's my HTML, fantastic. Of course, the client comes back and says, you know what? It's really a hassle to have to click on products every time. I want to get a list of pro uh, categories. Can you just like have a drop down menu of my product categories? Okay, fantastic. I'm going to just stick that UL in, you know, do a little thing where I hover over it, um, and I get this drop down menu. So I start creating the styles for it. Uh, but all the styles that I have, I now have to override these other styles that I had because this is a drop down, right? I'm no longer with this horizontal nav. I now have this drop down, which are likely to have a lot of different visual styles than that horizontal nav that I have to undo. Again, you'll notice now I have different CSS that is trying to apply to one element and they're competing. I don't want these styles, I want these wa ones over here, so I'm gonna throw selectors at the problem. I'm gonna double up with this li li. And it's really easy to isolate things uh, with child selectors, although I will ask this question. Anybody here still have to worry about IE6? Oh, thank God. Child selectors are a great way of limiting the impact and being able to isolate styles so that they only apply to the elements that you care about. So now that we've done this, now that we've isolated these styles, we can worry about the menu, which is a different piece, right? And we're gonna give it a, its own class because it's a different visual style. It's a different pattern than the horizontal nav. So with this menu, I'm gonna give the styles, and again, using child selectors to isolate these things. By doing this, I end up with less CSS at the end of the day. The more projects I work on with this approach, the more I see that at the end of the day, I end up with less code instead of more. Now, in this idea of isolation, though, you're like, well, how do you get that drop-down menu to appear? Uh, and this is gonna kind of jump into my next contentious thing, where, you know, from a CSS perspective, this is pretty straightforward. I've got a nav, when I hover over the list item, show the menu, right? I'm gonna suggest you don't do this. If we look at the HTML for this page, yes, I have my nav, yes, I have my menu. How do I isolate these things uh, to the point where I'm not combining styles across modules? How can I keep things uh, isolatable on their own, testable. Well, I'm gonna take that menu out of there, right? I wanna be able to have that menu somewhere else by itself. And in its place, I'm gonna create an element that's gonna be a wrapper for my dropdown. And it's related to the nav. I've got my nav module, I've got nav hyphen dropdown, these things are related. Now, for simple sites, this probably seems like a lot of work. Um, and it really does depend on the project, but I find that the larger the project is, the more uh, maintenance that you have to do on it, the more it grows. The longer term uh, that something extends out, the more likely you're gonna run into these types of issues. Uh, and the thing is, is that now that I've got this, I can put anything in here, and I don't care, right? My nav dropdown, the stuff, I can test that nav. By itself, I know what it's gonna look like. And that means, you know, I might have this little drop down here, uh, like on the Engadget website, or I might have a really complicated one 
where I've got this huge dropdown. But from a CSS perspective, that nav, I can test it by itself. These dropdowns, I can test each one by itself. And I have this pattern that is actually the same CSS that applies to any of these dropdowns. Right? Each one is isolatable, it's testable. So with that, it's about also not styling based on context. OK, what do I mean by not styling based on context? Let's say I have a modal dialog. So the modal dialog is made up of certain parts. Right? I've got my modal header, I've got my modal footer, and then I have my modal body. So in that, I have a bunch of content that I'm going to put in there. And it may feel natural that, you know what, I have these inputs, this form, that I want to style specifically to look a certain way in that modal dialog. But again, another recipe for disaster. Don't do this. What you want to do is just take components um, and isolate them. And it's interesting how we start to see these patterns over time. Some of these things may not be obvious from the outset. Like as much as Dan Mall's idea of building out this sort of library of pieces right from the get-go, sometimes it's not obvious until you're well within a project when you start to see these patterns. So at Shopify, you know, in the top left-hand corner, we got a little drop-down that pops down. And in there, pretty straightforward, class equals drop-down, uh, and we have a list of items. Fantastic. Uh, and the CSS for this, we could do something like this. Works great. Fantastic. Um, but we also have date pickers. Um, we have this uh, little uh, filter builder. We have these contact cards. And these all, at first glance, might seem like different elements, that we would create classes for each of these pieces. But what you might have noticed is that the shell for each of these dropdowns was actually the same. Right? We've got this box, we've got this drop shadow, we have this little fang that sticks out. It is that outside container that we can actually create a style for, we can isolate it, and then we can put whatever content that we want in there, whether it's a date picker, whether it's a, a list of navigation, whether it's a bunch of form fields. And we don't care about the context uh, of things. Yeah, we want to take these things and separate them, isolate them, and it's these kind of patterns that are not necessarily obvious from the get-go. You're going to have to refactor code. Don't be afraid to refactor. I love that at Shopify, we actually go through a regular process of refactoring code. We recognize where, uh, because this is a long-running project, I and mean, Shopify is seven years old. We have a code base that is seven years old that we have to maintain, and hopefully will maintain for years to come. And if you have that piece of the project that just lingers and dies, I remember talking to this company uh, a couple months ago, and they were, we were talking about our process, and you know, I was explaining how like, we, we go through a regular refactoring process. And they were saying, yeah, we don't really do that. In fact, we have pieces of the app that people refuse to work on because they're afraid of breaking it. Right? If it's not broke, don't fix it. They actually had parts of their website that hadn't been changed in years because you know, it works. We don't want to touch it. We don't want to break a thing. This is like a critical piece. Nobody's going to touch it ever again. Um, and that's a scary thing, to have parts of your app uh, that remain untouched. Now, out of this kind of work, um, so in the book I have this concept called depth of applicability. Now when I talked about it in the book, I was talking about it in regards to something like this, from a CSS perspective, in that, okay, from my website I have a comments div with a comment div with a meta div, with a comment number div. Like, that link that I'm trying to style over there is, I have to have this HTML structure exist for this to work. Now again, my HTML on my website hasn't changed in five years, fantastic. I can go home, I don't care. Uh, but chances are the projects that you're working on are changing over time, right? They're evolving. And it's that evolution that, you know, we want to be able to not have to paint ourselves into a corner that we can't get out of. Uh, so what we want to do is limit the depth of applicability. And sometimes these things, again, are kind of subtle. The difference between this and this may actually be the same thing. That link, that link color that I'm trying to style down there, I've created 
this, you know, the number of HTML elements between these things is actually still rather deep. I've got comments, comment, meta, comment number, link. So just like the, the dropdown where we're, we're trying to figure out what within that applies, I've recognized that from an HTML perspective, the same thing also applies with depth of applicability, that I don't want uh, this sort of deep nesting of things within a given module. I want to be able to slice things down, likely no more than three deep. For those of you that use a preprocessor, in fact, probably many of you use SAS, the SAS team actually has this thing called the inception rule. The inception rule is don't nest more than three levels deep because you get these long selector chains that come out of that. And so not only do you get that within SAS, you can get that within just hand coding, but also within HTML. Like, How are you slicing things to identify what a module is and what a reusable component is? And chances are, it's usually not more than three deep. If it is, we need to refactor. And so if I was refactoring my own website, I would do this. Again, nice and easy, it's part of the comment. Uh, I've got my author name, and I've got uh, a link within my comment number, done, right? Despite the simplicity of my website, I can make it even simpler. And this process works not only for simple websites, uh, but it worked well for the work we were doing at Yahoo um, and has continued to work well at the work I do at Shopify. So, you know, with those dropdowns, I can take out those contents, and my dropdown is now really light, right? I have a single element, that's my container. I can use like a before or an, uh, colon after the pseudo elements for the little fang, uh, the drop shadows. Uh, thankfully, I don't have to use like image backgrounds and weird multiple divs. CSS3 saves us from a lot of that hell. And my HTML is super simple. And now I can put whatever content that I want in there. I love it. And my CSS as a result is also very simple. I can test what my dropdowns look like in a number of situations, nice and easy. So what I do want to mention is that preprocessors do not solve architecture problems. So many times have I talked to somebody, it's like, oh, we use SAS, we're good. Somebody even created this lovely little graph, I like this, so, you know, people that are a little naive to CSS, if they're using a preprocessor, fam, obviously this person was a little biased towards SAS, they put them a little bit higher. Um, but I love that <laughs> somebody, not me, I, I, I will, uh, say that <laughs> someone who actually knows how to use CSS. I wonder how many people actually know how to use CSS. I, I'm still learning things. Uh, I, I amazed myself the other day. I'm like, wow, you can do like visibility visible inside of visibility hidden. I have no idea when I would use it, but I learned it, excellent. Because you can easily paint yourself into a corner with a preprocessor, right? At Shopify, yeah, we use SAS, awesome. But we still had this big ass file. And that created so many headaches, made it difficult to find what we were looking for. Uh, and sure enough, I was looking for a large class and it turned out it was in three different places. And because of nesting, I couldn't find exactly what applied to what and where. So, you know, I can use nesting and in this example, works great, right? The generated CSS that I have, beautiful, nice and small, simple. Love it. Uh, but when we start getting into this deep nesting, right, we start creating these long selector chains, our depth of applicability uh, between that link that I'm styling uh, and the container it needs to be in becomes really deep. Now, I do like nesting media queries. This is like one of my favorite features of, of SAS. Uh, just being able to do this, you know, when you're taking a modular approach, this works fantastic. Um, and you know, it'll automatically generate that stuff for you. I love it. Uh, but here's another example of where you might get kind of thrown into something that maybe is a little too complicated. Uh, so for example, you have a module, um, and in there you've got a, a hover state, um, and then maybe you have a subcomponent. So again, if you're thinking like maybe that modal dialog. Um, so within the modal dialog, maybe there's some weird thing that when I hover over it, it like changes the style of it. Um, and then I've got, again, my, my modal header, my modal footer. But I have a variation on this, and this might be my large modal, so it's a little bit wider, a little bit higher. Uh, and so I'm gonna use SAS to extend the style uh, in this particular case. 
I recommend you take a look at the generated CSS for that. This is what it would look like. And you'll notice that it's doubling up on selectors all over the place. When I go to look at a web inspector, uh, you know, I'm in Chrome, or maybe I'm using Firebug in Firefox, and I'm looking at what CSS is being applied, and I start seeing th this mass of classes. This is one of the reasons why I hate CSS resets. I know, again, another contentious thing. I don't like CSS resets, because I hate coming into a web inspector and seeing like a slew of this element, this element, this element, this element, this element, of all these styles being crossed off, because the only thing I cared about was this one thing. Because all the CSS was being created and then being overridden by something else. And I don't want to have that kind of situation. I want to keep it as lean so that the CSS I'm creating is in as much of a situation as I can have it is only applied to a single element. And that makes it really easy to test, really easy to debug. And so how could I refactor this so that I don't have this kind of situation appear? And it's really simple. You can actually avoid the nesting. Uh, so I have my module hover, I've got my module submodule, and I have my module subcomponent. My CSS is lean, it's small, it's compact. And from an HTML perspective, it's still clear what each of these things are. I haven't made my life more difficult. If anything, I've made it simpler. Okay, so what does this all mean? Uh, you know, I've done all this stuff. And again, I think Denmal really drove it home well this morning, um, and that is, you know, that we're trying to shift our thinking. We're trying to shift it from the idea of coding CSS for a page that I've got like, I need to start at the top, I'm gonna style my header, I'm gonna style my body, I'm gonna style my footer, and then I'm gonna move on to the next page. What has changed, right? I'm gonna, oh, this changed over here, I'm gonna create some new styles for this, I'm gonna throw it onto the bottom. I'm gonna move on to the next page, okay, what's changed? Oh, this is different over here, I'm gonna throw it onto the bottom of this CSS file. And that's not something that scales very well as you have a project that grows and grows. So by creating a system, it's gonna be a lot easier to take a component and pull it together. And so atomic design um, is a great approach um, that I think works well for this system. You know, that you can take each of these components and pull them together. Uh, I like Pattern Lab. Pattern Lab is probably the closest thing that I've found uh, in the last couple of years that comes close to the prototyping engine that we used at Yahoo. We had built our own prototyping engine that would automatically compile up a bunch of pieces. So we would have a template file. We used mustache, so we'd have this .mu file. And it would automatically associate, based on naming convention, a JSON file. That JSON file was the mock data for that project. So we would say, you know what, this is gonna be an edit event modal dialog. So we'd create our uh, template for the modal dialog. We'd take some JSON that would put in language strings and all that kind of stuff. And then we would create the CSS for it. And that template might include buttons. And the compiler would automatically compile everything into something that I could look at on a browser. So I could load it up into a bunch of browsers, I could test any number of scenarios, but I could test things in isolation. Uh, so it was fantastic, and so this is one of the reasons why I love Pattern Lab. Um, and so I'm just gonna touch on one last thing, which is the idea of state-based design. So with state-based design, so now that you've got these modules, now that you've got this isolation, that I can take these things and represent them in different ways, in different states, that you know, with that, I'm gonna start off with my module, and I might have a variation on that module, so that's my sub-module. Um, I might have these JavaScript-driven states that get applied to that, like is it active, is it hidden, uh, is it collapsed, whatever that is that I need to apply. But there's also other ones. We have pseudo-class states. We have things like hover, and focus, and active. There's a bunch of other ones coming in now, things like valid and invalid, and. Um, you know, all these pseudo classes that might change the state based on the interactions that people are having with the stuff on the page. And we also have media query states, right? That as people are viewing it on their phone or on their tablet or on their desktop or resizing their browser, that we can change states from one to the other in how we represent those uh, components. 
We are admittedly a little limited right now um, in that we don't have element-based queries. Uh, if we ever have that, I think that a lot of the stuff with this kind of modularization will just explode uh, because it'll make it so much easier. I would love to get that. Um, and so I just want to show this really lovely little game. Uh, I love this. Um, not because it's like the hardest game ever. Uh, you know, you just click on these alligators, whatever. Uh, but I love it because there's not one line of JavaScript to drive this game. This is all done completely with CSS. And I think this is an example of where we're heading when it comes to web design. Not that we're all going to be making games, but that we can take components and we can apply states to them that do different things. So for example, each of those alligators um, are enemies. And the thing that really kind of jumped out at me here is this. They're changing the appearance to be a button. And that might not be really clear why, but it's because, you know what? Those alligators are actually checkboxes. And of course, you can't really style a checkbox, uh, so they, they change the appearance to a button so they can style it to look like an alligator. And so when I click on that alligator, I am changing the state of that particular element. So it was using CSS animations to just bring it down. And then what happens when I click on it, it says, take it off the canvas. Don't respond to mouse events. Um, re remove the opacity, remove the animation. This thing no longer exists uh, on the canvas. This is fantastic, right? So all we're doing is we're saying, I've got this thing on the page, and I want to change the state of it. It's modularized, it's one thing, so they had a bunch of enemies. Each one would have its own class, and I can change the look and feel of each of those. So I think that's a fantastic way of, of approaching this. So to summarize, to bring it all together, uh, number one, modularize, right? The ability to uh, take these components and be able to create a reusable system. That was one of the, the major things that we needed to do at Shopify, because everything was intertwined and made it very difficult for us to maintain. You know, use a naming convention to establish an identity. How are these things all belong? You know, clarify the intent of what this thing is meant to do on our page. Isolate things. By isolating things, we make them easier to templatize, easier to test. This is what we want. And lastly, don't be afraid to refactor. You know, as great as it was at Yahoo to come in and be able to start from scratch, that wasn't something that we can do. And chances are, if you're taking this approach and wondering how to apply it onto your project, don't be afraid to refactor. That CSS that I showed you with all those different modules did not happen overnight. In fact, it started with one file, and that file was our button. I said, you know what, I'm going to take buttons. That's a, something that I can work on one piece at a time. And I created a file, and I started refactoring. I moved all the styles from the style CSS and moved it there. And I just slowly did that piece by piece. And it, we're still not 100% there. I would say probably 75%. And that's OK. We're slowly moving in the right direction um, to get to where we want to be. Again, just iterate one piece at a time. And with that, I want to say thank you very much.